Hello and welcome to Gripsed Poker Training. Thank you for joining me. My name is Evan and I will be your instructor for the day. Today we will be covering the triple threat, a technique that professional poker players use to maximize their profits and minimize their losses. What you're going to learn today is going to enable you to tilt the scales in your favor and maximize your odds of winning every time you sit down at the poker tables. Anyway, enough introductions and enough talk. Let's get started so you can start making more money. Let's begin by looking at the three elements that compose the triple threat. The first is position. Experienced players will be familiar with this and its importance. Beginners might not even be familiar with the word. I'll just say that position is to poker what location is to real estate far and away the most important element of the game. Position is the most important yet frequently overlooked concept in poker. Next we have aggression, which means taking more aggressive actions when given the option. One thing that all good players have in common, whether they are loose or tight, is that they play an aggressive game. Playing an aggressive game puts you on the offense and puts your opponents on the defensive. It is the ideal way to play poker because it keeps you in control of the action. This would mean choosing betting over checking and raising over calling in the majority of situations. There will obviously be exceptions like when we are trapping or getting good odds, but in general it's better to play aggressive than passive. Finally, we have the third element of the triple threat, selection. This concept refers to being selective in terms of which hands you play. Yeah, you can't just play any two suited cards, any pair, or any face cards in every situation. Some hands will be very profitable in some situations and will be big money losers in other situations. It's important to know which situations are profitable for which types of hands. Your cards are the least important element of your decisions at the poker table. However, they are still an important element. By combining this three-pronged attack, you will be a force to be feared at the poker tables and your opponents will always be left guessing as to what you're up to. We're going to go into further detail on each of these concepts now so you can have a better understanding of why they're important, how to use them, and well, how to play your best poker. I'm sure you'll have many questions which I will be happy to field in the comments section of the video, but I've taken the liberty of preparing some questions of my own which I'm guessing we're probably going to show up on your list. So why is position so valuable? The first benefit is that you get to act last on each street which means you will have more information than your opponents who have to act first or second. Since poker is a game of imperfect information and your job is to make the best decisions given the information you have, you will obviously be more able to make better decisions when you have more information. Score one point for position. Another benefit to this information is that it's free. When you have position, you don't need to spend money on each street to get your information. You don't need to make bets to get reactions. Your opponents are forced to act before you and you get to interpret the reasons for their actions. The natural flow of the action in the game gets you your information for free. The information will also be pretty accurate most of the time too, so long as you interpret it properly. The player in position has such a big advantage on those out of position that they often have to play more cautiously. Players are much less likely to get tricky when they're out of position, especially when many players are in the pot, so you can put a good amount of weight into the information you collect by being in position. Moving away from simply information gathering, there are still more benefits to position and these are the benefits that force your opponents to play more cautiously. The first is that the action flows through you on every street. 
You get to act last, so you can usually decide if the stakes are fine and you'd like to move on to the next street, be it the flop, turn, or river, or if the stakes should be raised and your opponents will have to pay for more cards. Since you usually close the action on each street, you can decide whether the pot will be small or large following the same concept. When we are in position, we can make sure that the maximum number of bets possible goes in on each street. When we are out of position, we don't have the same luxury. We are at the mercy of the player who is in position. Finally, being in position allows you to take off free cards if your opponents check to you for fear of getting raised and being forced to play a big pot. You always have the option to check back and take a free card rather than upping the stakes. It's a lot easier to take in these concepts that I will elaborate on more throughout the education process. If you don't understand them all yet, that's okay. Just know that position is good. It's very good. So, how do you determine your position? Your position is defined as your location relative to the button. In online poker, the button is typically a circle with a D on it. You should be able to locate it on the table. It's just above that $1 chip near the top right corner. In live poker, the dealer button is typically a white button with the word dealer written on it. Go figure. The button moves around the table every hand in a clockwise fashion so that everyone gets position an equal share of the time. In Hold'em in Omaha, your position is also a factor of your location relative to the blinds. I was once told that a picture is worth a thousand words, so I'm going to slow down on the talking and let these graphics here do the explaining. The three players to the left of the blinds are in early position. The three players to their left are in middle position. The player on the button and the player to the right of the button are in late position. And the players in the blinds are out of position. It is commonly preached that you should play tight when you are out of position, so early position, and loose when you are in late position. There are a couple of reasons for this. The first is that the fewer players left to act behind you, the less likely you are to run into a real hand, and therefore you are more likely to win the pot. But building on this concept, if every player behind you folds except for the blinds, then suddenly you become in position for the rest of the hand regardless of where you open from. Remember, it's whoever still has cards who is closer to the button that is in position. So even if you raise from early position and everyone save the blinds folds, you have effectively, quote unquote, bought the button. You might as well have the button sitting right in front of you because you are the player who is now in position. And you will be in position for the rest of the hand. So raising in a later position just increases your odds of buying the button and having position throughout the hand. The player on the button, if they choose to play the pot, will obviously always have position on all the other players. Now the graphic here is for a ten-handed table, common to the live poker setting. Most online tables are nine-handed or six-handed. Whenever a seat is removed from play, take it away from early position. So in a six-handed table, early position doesn't really exist. You have two seats in middle position, two seats in late position, and two seats that are out of position. For this reason, the terminology of early position and middle position and late position isn't so much important as the concept of position. Once you make it to the flop, whoever is closer to the button has position, and you want to focus on being in position rather than out of position. Next question. What are the different types of position? 
The first is absolute position, which is what we've been discussing for the past two slides. Your position relative to the button determines how good your position is, if you are in position or out of position. He who is in position gets to see what his opponents do before he has to act. The next type of position is relative position, which is your position relative to the preflop raiser or aggressor. When someone takes an aggressive action before the flop, they usually follow it up with an aggressive action before the flop. I hope you're thinking triple threat. So being the next player to act after them means you will have to react to them first. If, however, two players are between you and the preflop raiser, now they have to react first to the aggressive player, and you get more information before you make your decision. This is the beauty of relative position. Even when you don't have absolute position, you can still find yourself acting last on post-flop streets, which is almost as good as having absolute position. To pick up relative position, don't be the first caller of a raise. Make sure there are other callers sandwiched between you and the preflop raiser. This is why I will encourage being very selective when you are the first caller of a raise, but less selective when you are the third or fourth caller. Relative position, just like absolute position, allows you to get extra information at no extra cost. Whoever has bad relative position will often have to reveal their hand strength because they don't want to be attempting fancy plays when playing out of position. The worse your relative position is, the harder it will be to disguise your hand. Due to this, you might as well only have strong hands when you know you are going to have bad relative position for the duration of a hand. All right, that wraps up our introduction to the awesomeness of position. Let's move on to aggression. So your first question probably is, why is it important to be aggressive? First answer, because it gives you multiple ways to win the pot. The first way you can win the pot is if your opponent doesn't match your bet and folds. The second way you can win the pot is if you end up having the best hand at showdown, which is when the hands are turned over. When you play passive, the only way you can win the pot is if you have the best hand. When you only check and call, you never even give your opponent the option of folding. And while the game is not entirely about making your opponents fold their hands, it's still an integral part of the game. Playing aggressively also allows you to use many other key concepts, such as value betting. Value betting means setting a fair price on the value of your hand and getting paid off the price you set. Value betting is a concept that exists when you have the best hand. However, you can also try to set the price when you think you might be beat to limit your losses rather than letting your opponent decide how much it will cost you to see their hand. Betting and being aggressive also allows you to bluff, which means making your opponent fold a better hand than yours. Anytime your opponent folds a hand, even if it's one worse than yours, you gain, except on the river. Every hand, even gut shots, single over cards, have some chance of getting lucky and winning the pot. This is referred to as their equity. When your opponent folds their hand, they surrender their equity in the pot, and this gives you a net gain, which is the size of the pot times whatever the percentage equity was that they forfeited when they folded. On the river, the exception, hands either have 100% equity, they're the best hand, or 0% equity. They are a second best hand. Now imagine how much you could make in value if you can make your opponents fold better hands on the river. That's one of the big values of bluffing. Making our opponents fold also means that we eliminate the chance of getting unlucky or getting sucked out on. 
When we can eliminate the luck factor from the game, it pretty much all comes down to skill. So what it comes down to is by playing aggressively, you give your opponents the chance to make a mistake. David Sklansky, a fantastic poker author, wrote the fundamental theorem of poker. And it implies that the goal of the game is to make as few mistakes as possible. You want to win the battle of mistakes. Playing aggressively enables you to do this. Because if you don't play aggressively, and you never give your opponents a chance to make a mistake, how could they ever make one? Playing aggressively also allows you to semi-bluff, which is similar to bluffing. You are betting without the best hand and would love for your opponent to fold. However, even when they call, you'll still have outs to improve to the best hand on later streets. When you are semi-bluffing early in a hand, you may be value betting by the river, or you may still be bluffing by the river. It all depends on what cards come off. So we know that betting and being aggressive is good, but how good is it? I'm sure there are some math people watching out there, and they want some proof of the benefits. So let's do some quick calculations. By the way, if you don't like math, you can skip this part. Actually, I'm just kidding. The math that I'm going to show you is very simple, and you'd be cheating yourself if you skipped any parts of this video. To determine the value we gain by bluffing, we need to look at what we're risking, which is the amount we're betting, and what we stand to gain as a reward, which is what's in the pot. Next, we want to look at the break-even success rate, which is risk divided by risk plus reward. The reason I'm using this as my example is because I want to show you that when you're playing aggressive, you still don't have to be right that much of the time. In poker, you tend to get good odds on your money, and thus your success rate when you make an aggressive play doesn't have to be that high. Take some real number examples to get you comfortable with this formula. It's very simple but very important for your development as a pr player to practice this concept. Some quick examples I did on my own. I took a pot of $100. When I bluffed the full pot, my risk is 100, my reward is 100. And therefore, my break-even success rate, 1 over 2, is 50%. When I bluffed two-thirds of the pot, risk is 67 reward is 100, now it's 67 over 167, which yields a break-even success rate of 40%. Here's a chart that shows the break-even success rates for various bet sizings. Full pot, 50%. Three-quarter pot, C-bet, 43% required. If you bet half the pot, your break-even success rate is a success rate of one out of three. Quarter of the pot, it only has to work one time out of five. Even when you're making a huge bet, like double the pot, you still only have to be successful two-thirds of the time to break even. There is no amount that you would have to bet where you have to be right to make that bet 100% of the time. The cool thing about this is that usually a bet of one-half to three-quarters of the pot will yield the same results in terms of your opponent's reaction as a full pot size bet. So by selecting your bet sizing properly, you can dramatically improve your odds of showing a profit on that play. Also, note that if your opponent is folding more than the break-even success rate requires, you are showing a profit right away. You might think this is great. I can bet a tenth of the pot and my play only needs to work like 9% of the time to be successful. I can just bet tiny every time. That thinking is definitely on the right track. But at some points, bets are too small to ever work as a bluff. This is when you might want to use them as value bets. With experience, you will learn what bet sizes are enough to get the job done against which types of players 
and what bet sizes are excessive and unnecessary. Now I know what you're saying. This is all well and good. But how do I know that my opponents are going to fold 33% or 50% of the time? How am I supposed to determine that? Well, most casual players, the types you'll find in casinos and home games, play fit or fold poker, meaning they will only continue after the flop if their two-card hand improved somehow. Players will completely miss the flop about half the time, meaning they won't flop any piece, not even a gut shot. There's your 50%. Semi-bluffing, we discussed on the last slide. The formula is a bit complicated and dicey, so I'll stick with a simple concept. If your math from pure bluffing is showing a profit, and you are actually, in fact, semi-bluffing, which means betting with a hand that has some equity in the pot, then it just means that your bet is even more profitable. Your equity works somewhat like an insurance plan. That is, sometimes, when you hit your hand, you will get all the money back you invested in your bluff, and then some. Now that you understand the math behind aggression, I want to introduce more benefits of aggression that apply at higher level poker as well. The first is that an aggressive player generally gets to control the action. Most recreational players are hoping to see cards cheaply, so rather than bet, they usually opt to check. There is a lot of slow playing going on, which means more checking. This gives the aggressive player full control of the action, and they will always be the ones setting the price and determining the pot sizes. They keep the pot small when they want to play a small pot, and they make the pots big when they have a big hand and want to play a big pot. Recreational players also like to try and trap aggressive players. If you are a smart, aggressive player, though, you will avoid these traps and truly have free reign over the table since nobody will be able to put you to tough decisions. Being aggressive also instills fear in your opponents. You are always in the action, betting, check raising, making big plays, and in all honesty, most people don't enjoy being put to tough decisions. It stresses them out and makes them feel crappy when they make the wrong decision. Because of these feelings that they get, opponents will try to avoid you and also take cautious, safe routes against you. This will allow you to do as you please, since your opponents will be very reluctant to take a stand against you or get in your way. We've covered this concept a couple of times now, and it's basically the whole game. You want to force your opponents into mis making mistakes while avoiding mistakes yourself. When you have near full control of the action, it's very unlikely that you will be the one making mistakes because you will be in your comfort zone while they will be out of theirs. When opponents feel pressure, they often make mistakes. So keep the pressure on. Finally, playing in an aggressive manner will make you look like a bit of a maniac to some people, especially the tighter, more conservative players. They won't give you credit for being a good thinker and having a good poker mind, and may just assume that you're a fast and loose gambler who likes to throw money around. This means that you won't get credit for having strong hands as often as you should. When people think you're bluffing all the time, you can get paid off when you actually have a strong hand and suddenly bet big. Because they don't see the difference in the size of the bet, they just see he's betting all the time. Whereas if you play like a rock, everyone will know you only play big hands, and therefore they won't give you any action when you start putting a lot of money in the pot. It will be very difficult for you to get paid off when you actually make a hand. The aggressive player has the best of both worlds. He gets to pick up all the small pots without contest, 
and has a much better chance of getting looked up and paid off in the big pots, which is where you will probably actually have the goods. All right. You should now be familiar with the dynamic duo of poker. Position and aggression. On their own, these two superheroes of concepts can do a lot of damage. See, in poker, a vast majority of the pots and hands played are one without a showdown, meaning the actual holdings of the winner don't matter. But then again, some pots, especially the biggest pots, typically do require a showdown. And that's why I now introduce Position and Aggression's little sidekick, Selection. So when we're talking about cards and selection, you want to know what you're trying to accomplish with this concept. Here is the checklist that I have followed for my entire career, and it will give you a ton of benefits. First, think of yourself as a hand salesman at the tables. Your job is A, to sell people your good hands at a fair price that they are willing to pay, and B, sell your bad hands at an unreasonable price that people won't be willing to pay. This will allow you to bluff successfully. Since we already covered bluffing, we're going to focus on A, selling your good hands at a fair price. To make a hand worthy of sale, it has to be better than your opponent's hand. So you want to focus on making the best finishing hands. The way to accomplish this is to start with good starting hands. Higher ranking cards like King-Queen do better than lower ranking cards like 9-10, both in terms of making top pair and in terms of making bigger straights. The King-Queen will have stronger straight draws than the 9-10. The higher ranked your starting hands, whether they are pairs, suited hands, or connected hands, bigger is always better. By sticking with the strongest hands, you have a better chance of being on the right side of setup hands, which are also known as coolers. Sometimes in poker, situations happen where both players will have a hand that they just have to go all in with. It's unavoidable. An example would be if player one has pocket kings and player two has pocket twos and the flop comes king seven two. Both players have made their set and their hands are so strong that they're going to try to find a way to go all in. If you only play medium and big pocket pairs and throw away the small pairs, you would be much less likely to find yourself on the butt end of a set over set situation like that. So by exercising good selection, you can minimize the effect that coolers and setup hands will have on your win rate. As a good selector, you have to respect your equity and focus on only continuing in pots where you have good equity, also known as a good chance of winning the pot. Pot equity is what we discussed before. However, there is also fold equity, which is the chances that you can make your opponent fold. This is, again, where the strengths of aggression and position can override the strength of selection. Building on the equity concept, you must learn to play your pot odds, which means respecting the price that the pot is offering you and only playing on in situations where the odds are in your favor. And most importantly, when you implement selection properly, you now have the full power of the triple threat behind all of your actions, which gives you many ways to win the pots and many ways to win the game. Now you know equity is important and that you have to respect it. So it's time for me to tell you what your odds are of making any equity when you see the flop. This is how you acquire equity. Your odds of flopping a pair with two random cards is 33%. 
your odds of flopping a set, which is the number one biggest money maker in full table live poker games. It's 12.5%. Your odds of flopping a flush draw with suited cards are 11%, and your odds of flopping the made flush are just under 1%. And your odds of flopping a straight draw with connected cards are 7.5%, and the odds of flopping the made straight are just over 1%. Looking at these numbers, it should be pretty clear why a hand like Jack-10 suited is much better at picking up equity than ace-10 offsuit. Sure, the ace-10 can make better one pair in trips hands, which are good in heads-up or three-way pots, but the ability to pick up straight draws and flush draws with the suited connector means you will be catching a nice piece of the flop much more frequently and therefore being able to continue on in the hand with strong backup plans. The five-card hands like straights and flushes are the ones that win the biggest pots, and usually the hands that end up being the winners when there are four or five players seeing the flop. So you want to be focusing on hands that have the ability to make these five card hands. The less connected a hand is, the harder it is for it to flop a straight draw or a straight, and the lower in rank in strength a suited hand is, like 7-6 suited versus ace-deuce suited, the more dangerous it is, as making a second best flush will leave you drawing dead. That's right, you will have 0% equity, and that's not a spot that you want to be in when you are most likely committing all your chips to a pot, which is what most players do when they have a flush, regardless of the rank of flush. Many players have a misconception that Hold'em is a two-card game and that if they have an overpair or flop top pair, that they are entitled to winning the pot. If you can accept that it is a seven-card game and that hand strength by the river is much more important than hand strength before the flop, you will be at a big advantage over your opponents. It will lead to less frustration fewer mistakes, better peace of mind, and therefore less tilt at the poker table. And even most amateurs know that tilt is the number one money loser in this game. Okay, so now you know what your odds of flopping some sort of equity are, and you probably want to know what your odds of realizing that equity are, meaning turning that draw into the made hand that you are drawing to. Here's a chart that tells you your odds of improving to a strong made hand when starting with a draw or a marginal made hand. An out is a card that will make you the best hand. So if you have a diamond flush draw and believe you are against a pair, then hitting another diamond makes your hand. So each diamond is an out. Same with the straight draw. Any of the cards that come to make your four card straight into a five card straight, a now made hand, would be considered an out. With two pair, or sets, which is also known as three of a kind, making a full house will give you the winning hand over a straight or a flush. So even though two pair and three of a kind are typically considered made hands, if they are up against another made hand, they now become a drawing hand because they are drawing to a full house, which will beat the weaker made hands. So that's how you determine your outs. If you have two pair, sevens and fours, any seven or any four is an out to make a full house. There's two of each left, so that's, that's four outs. With a set, the reason why it's 10 and 7, when you have a set, if the board pairs, you make a full house. When you're looking at the flop, there's two cards that don't make your set that can pair. 
So three of each of those makes six outs, plus the one that makes you quads. That's what you're drawing to. But on the turn, now there's another card added in play that could pair. So that's what gives you the three more outs, making ten outs. One cool thing to note about this chart is that when you have a straight flush draw on the flop, and your opponent has some sort of hand where you assume that all 15 of your outs are good and will make you the winner, it's fine to try to get all your money in on the flop. You will expect to get 54% of the money you put in back, plus 54% of the money that your opponent calls, plus 54% of what's in the pot, meaning that you're going to show a profit. There are also a couple of hands that I didn't include on this chart, but are deceptively strong. A gut shot, or inside straight draw, has four outs, which with two cards to come, has a 16.5% chance of hitting. It's pretty big. And even two over cards, like if you have king-queen and the board's 10-6-3 and you think your opponent has 10-9, You can make the best hand by hitting top pair, which will happen about 24% of the time with two cards to come, because you have six outs and two chances to hit those six outs. That's probably much higher than you thought the odds were. So next time your buddy turns top pair on you with his two over cards, don't think it's quite as big of a bad beat as it used to be. Two over cards almost has as many outs as a straight draw. All right, bear with me because you have almost made it to the end of the lesson, but it's time for the most intense math of the lesson. The good news is the formula isn't much more complicated than the bluffing one from earlier, so it should be rather easy to get comfortable with. You know how to calculate your equity, so you now understand the way of the cards. Now we're going to talk odds so you can understand the ways of the betting. It's pretty important to understand the ways of the betting since betting is the only part of the game that you actually control. First, let's look at three examples of odds. Let's just hypothetically say me and you, I offer you a chance to play some games with me. First one is we'll play rock, paper, scissors for a, for a dollar apiece. So if you beat me, I'll give you a dollar, and if I beat you, you'll give me a dollar. In this case, you'd be getting even odds on your money, because it's a fair game. Game number two, let's say we'll flip a coin. Every time you lose, you have to pay me a dollar. But every time you win, I'll pay you five dollars. In this case, you would be getting good odds on your money. It would make sense to play that game as many times as you could. Third game. We'll roll a dice. Both sides, whoever wins, is even payout of a dollar. And if it comes five or six, you win. But if it comes one, two, three, or four, I win. In this case, you would be getting bad odds on your money. And you probably wouldn't want to play this game. At least me personally, that's how I feel about which games I'd like to play. So, of these three, which game would you like to play the most? It's probably the one where you're getting the best odds on your money. Now let's learn how to play that game at the poker tables. To calculate your pot odds, you have to take what you stand to win, and divide it by what you have to risk. What you stand to win is what's in the pot plus your opponent's bet. That's represented by the cost of call on the formula there. What you stand to risk is the amount that you have to call to continue. Once again, cost of call is going to be the same as cost of bet. An example is if your opponent bets $25 into a pot of $100, now there's $125 for you to win. And you have to call 
$25 to continue because you have to match their bet to continue. This would mean we have 125 up top, 25 on the bottom, which comes out to 5. You are getting 5 to 1 on your money. In this case, you could call with a straight draw, you could call with a flush draw, since those hands have more than 16.7% equity, and that's what 5 to 1 represents. 4 to 1 represents 20% equity, 3 to 1 is 25% equity, 2 to 1 is 33% equity. When your equity is the same as your pot odds, you are making, you are breaking even on your call. This applies to drying out or making a call on the river where your hand has to be good some percentage of the time to break even. When your equity is higher than the pot odds you are getting, you will be making money in the long run by calling. When your equity is lower than the pot odds you are getting, you will be losing or burning money in the long run by calling, and you would probably be better served to fold in these situations and look for a better spot to invest your money. Implied odds help you out when you are playing a drawing hand and think that there is money to be made by hitting your hand. Let's say your opponent has pocket aces and bets really small on the turn. You're sitting there with an inside straight draw. You know you got four outs to hit it. Let's say he offers you six to one odds on a call. you know you only have four outs and the odds you need when you have four outs is more like 10 to 1 so you're like well 6 to 1 is no good I guess I should fold well hold on a second if the bets twenty dollars so there's hundred in the pot and your opponent has another two hundred dollars behind this could still be a profitable opportunity for you if you can be certain given that he has pocket aces and he, that if he, you call, he's going to bet the river for at least a hundred bucks. Suddenly, your odds have just risen from six to one to eleven to one because of your expected payoff. If you think he'll pay off the full two hundred dollars on the river, either he'd bet it all or bet out and call a raise because maybe he has two pair or three of a kind. Now the odds are sixteen to one which makes for a very easy call. This is the value of drawing to disguised hands. Sneaky straights and tricky two pairs are some examples of these hands. While it's very obvious when a flush draw comes in, these other draws are often missed or ignored and therefore won't deter your opponent from continuing to commit a lot of money to the pot. The formula for implied odds is pretty much the same as pot odds, except you factor in your expected payoff, which increases your odds. While it's impossible to know the exact payoff you stand to gain, because just because someone has a big stack in front of them doesn't mean they're going to commit all of it to any pot in particular, the more familiar you get with your opponents, the better you will be at making this estimation. Before we finish the lesson, let's look at a few more odds that might surprise you. We're going to look at your odds of winning a preflop all-in. When you have a pocket pair bigger than your opponent's pocket pair, you can expect to win the pot four out of five times. This is easily one of the most profitable spots in poker. The only time the odds go down here is if you both have very small pocket pairs and there's a chance that you might get counterfeited. When you have two overcards against a pocket pair, you can expect to win about half the time. This is known as a coin flip. The more suited, connected, and middling the unpaired hands, which means they can make more straights, the better its odds will be. So you would actually rather have jack-10 suited than ace-king if you knew for certainty you were going to be up against a small pair. 
if the pair contains the same cards or some cards that will prevent you from making a straight with your over cards like pocket jocks versus ace king or cards that prevent you from making a flush the odds of the pocket pair can go as high as 57 percent which is a pretty serious increase in equity next is the one that's the most surprising for non-professional players pocket kings versus a lone ace are a favorite yeah but only about a two to one favorite that means the ace is going to come approximately one third of the time which is pretty frequent that means it's actually very common for this suck out to happen so don't get too upset when your kings lose to some crappy ace it happens to everybody and it happens a lot more than you probably thought two big cards versus two smaller cards are about a three to two favorite so you'll win three out of five board runouts an over pair against two under cards will win four out of five times this scenario doesn't come up often but when it does it's a very profitable one when you have your opponent dominated meaning you both share the same high card but you have a better kicker you will win around three out of four times this is another extremely profitable situation to be in ever see ace king versus ace queen yeah it's it's a good spot to be in and finally if you can get it all in with a pocket pair versus an opponent who has the same card as your pair as well as an undercard you'll win nine times out of ten sometimes ten times out of eleven this situation almost never arises but if it does and you get sucked out on that's a bad beat story worthy of telling your friends because it's it's a pretty big long shot and that concludes this lecture on the grips.com triple threat if you take this information to heart and understand it to its core you will have a very serious advantage on most if not all of your opponents if you're serious about your poker game watch this video again make notes do the exercises and most importantly ask me questions because I probably have the answers poker is a game that can be learned by anyone and you will get out of it whatever you put in if you're willing to work hard you will see positive results this has been Evan for Grips.com. Now go out there and get stacking.